when I got my Ferrari, like I was sure felt happier for three weeks or four weeks, but it's a very temporary peak and you come right back down to where you're normally at and then you're chasing your next material high and that's just not a way to live life. Danny or Dan, because you grew up, I wanted to bring you on the show. You can stay Danny. It's been okay. Danny. <laughs> I wanted to bring you on the show because it's about how people have built who they are. And I look at you, I look at your life, and I think you did it right. You have your dream job, your dream home. You started a nonprofit for your bulldog rescue, which is your passion. You have the nice house, the nice cars. You've made it, it as as i look at it and i just really want to know your road to success and how you got to where you are and just kind of how you have built your life and become this person that you've always wanted to be yeah and it's funny it's like you know as you say it like there's so many thoughts that go through my head because it's as the road continues like the the what you want changes right like it's always changing for me like the what I want is not the same now as it was when I started down the road right and I think that I got really lucky because I mean Katie you've known me shit since I was like what sixth grade seventh grade I don't even know like <laughs> Eagle Idaho style so, yeah and it's too long know? Danny yeah I mean it's like who I was then and who I was when I was 20 and who I was when I'm 25 and who I was when I'm 30 like it's just so different every step of the way and you know I I got lucky because I think that I started down the road the wrong way. Like I started going, what can I do to make the most amount of money? Right? Like what can I do to not, you know, not worry about finances. And that's why I started and did my law degree and did my master's of business. And it wasn't because it was like, Oh, I want to, you know, help people or I want to do it for the right reasons. It was what, is the path that I will be able to be financially successful. And now I like lecture people, like that's the opposite way to go about it. Like it's so stupid because you're going to end up making money and being miserable. And I meet so many people that are in that boat. And I think I just got lucky because although I did it for the wrong reasons and I did it for the financial path, I ended up stumbling onto something that I really loved. And that to me is like the biggest blessing that I've had is that I could be that person that yeah, is you know, well off and financially successful, but is just miserable. And as it's like, as life's developed, it's like the car's don't mean shit anymore. You know, like that kind of shit just kind of goes by the wayside. And I think that that's something that, the perspective of learning that young and learning that the material stuff just is material stuff and doesn't add anything to the happiness picture is a huge, huge life gift. I, I mean, I was an idiot. I had two Ferraris before I was 30 years old. Right. Like, and it's like, now I look back at it and I'm just like, I'm so glad I got it out of my system because what I realized is when you're buying shit like that, you're not buying it for yourself. You're buying it for other people. You're buying it for appearance. You're buying it for ego. You're buying it for, you know, all those other ancillary things that don't really like touch your soul or, you know, do anything for your life. And your happiness will peak when you get like, when I got my Ferrari, like I was sure felt happier for three weeks or four weeks, but it's a very temporary peak and you come right back down to where you're normally at and then you're chasing your next material high and that's just not a way to live life. And so I'm very grateful for the life I have. I'm very grateful for the life I've built, but I'm grateful that I've, I've, I've realized the shit that matters and the shit that doesn't matter. Right. And last year, like 2020 was an eye opener. Like I never thought I'd be saying like, I might not last in San Diego if things stay this way. Maybe I belong back in Idaho. Maybe like I just look at life so much differently now and happiness so much differently now. And it, it's, it's not nearly as controlled by material as it used to be. And I'm grateful for that. You see way too many people chasing the money, way too many people chasing money. I had a conversation with a girl the other day and we have a friend that's a real estate agent out here in Vegas and she posts pictures of her Lambo all the time. Yep. And she was like, man, I want to be a real estate agent. 
I want to go to real estate school. I'm like, is it just because she has a Lambo and that's why you want to go to real estate school? She goes, yeah, I don't really want to be a real estate agent. I just want to make money. So what are you doing in the long run? Like, it's almost like a void. You're filling a void with the money. You're filling a void with the car. So how, how are you going to ever be happy if you're constantly chasing something that's really not within yourself as far as finding that happiness? So it really does make sense. But starting out, I mean, you went to school, you went to business school. Was being a lawyer something you always wanted to do? Did you know from the get-go, like, hey, I want to be a lawyer? Or was it, hey, I want to be a lawyer because it makes money? What was kind of, was that your passion? Yeah, I've always known that I was going to, that I, I, I just, it's, it's been like in my mind since I was a kid. Like that. I think it's ingrained in your DNA by the way that you are, because you're such a shit that you <laughs> literally. <laughs> I'm ornery. I'm going to argue with you. Like, it's just like, that's just always been me. And so I've always known that 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 was going to be the path, right? Like, did I ever think I was going to be a personal injury attorney? Hell no. Like that was never, when I went to law school, most, most guys that go to law school, you'll ask them what they want to be. And the answer is I want to be a sports agent, right? Like that's the like law school deal. And now I look at it and laugh because very few end up going that route. Right. And you just kind of like figure out your path along the way, those three years. But that was me. I wanted to be a sports agent. And then once I was in law school, in my master's doing internships, I, you know, I interned at the U S attorney's office, hated it, interned at some big corporate firm, hated it. And then interned at PI and immediately like day, day two was like, this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. Cause it was just, it's very human, right? Like you're dealing with people that have their lives twisted upside down and they don't know how to get it back together. And you're that person that gets to put the pieces back together and see it through the other side. And immediately it was just something that, you know, struck me. And I was like, I could do this for the rest of my life. And it wasn't about the money. Like I was making like $55,000 a year, my first job. Like I didn't, I wasn't making good money. People think you come out of law school and you're making cheddar and you're, you're not like you're, you're struggling. And it was just the, it was the relationships. It was the, um, the people that I got to meet. It was the perspective that I would gain from watching people, you know, wake up and think they're going to live a normal day and life happens. And, that day ain't normal and neither's the next day and the next day. And so those perspective shifts just kind of fed me and that it, it, it's, it's what I will do for the rest of my life. Like I'm, I'm lucky enough now to be in a financial position where I can start other businesses and do other things and have other fun side projects, but this will be the main, you know, my main thing for the rest of my life. And it's not like a work it's, I do it now because I, I want to do it. Like I, I, wouldn't be here if I didn't want to be here. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been crazy how it's evolved. So you're a very successful lawyer attorney in San Diego and you have your own law firm. And I just kind of want to know, do you have any secrets to success or a roadmap that you followed in order to kind of get to where you are right now? Yeah. So, um, one, when you're starting a business, make sure you're reinvesting back into that business. I see so many business owners that like the first time they make money, they're going and buying a car, they're going on vacation or they're doing something. It's the stupidest shit. Like that's not how businesses grow. Like you put your money back in your business and you let your business grow. And that's like a long-term, not a short, plan. And I think that so many business owners, unfortunately have short-term like goal sets that get in the way of long-term vision. So for example, when we started the law firm, we didn't take a dollar out of this place for 18 months. And I mean like not a single buck and it was a really long year and a half, but that's how we were able to hire some of the best attorneys in town. That's how we were able to, you know, get a really nice office. And, you know, with, with my baby face, it was weird for me starting a firm at 31 years old and people looked at me like, you're too young to be doing this. And so I had to do it the right way and I had to build it the right way. And us reinvesting every buck back into it was what allowed us to do that. And I just don't think people understand that. I don't think people understand savings. Like look at la- this last year, like businesses are going under cause they don't, they they're month to month. Like they just don't save money. Every business should have six months of their operating overhead sitting in an account. Like it should be there at all times. Like that should be your, your COVID account or your whatever account. Like whenever some curve ball of life comes, which it will, You should be able to have, uh, you know, a safety net there and so many businesses don't. So those simple, like 
basic structures were absolutely instrumental for us. And then knowing what you don't know, like I have mentors, I have coaches, I have consultants, I've hired and paid tens of thousands of dollars for business consultants to come in and tear apart my law firm and tear apart my systems and processes. And people are like, you run one of the best law firms in San Diego. Thank God. I appreciate it. And I do, but there's, it's constant evolution, right? Like who would I be if I'm not constantly trying to make it better and constantly trying to improve on what we do. And so I think that you, you have to get to a place where you're humble enough to realize you don't know everything. You need to bring in other people. You need to bring on, you know, mentors, and have people that are doing it longer, doing it better that you can go to. And that's been huge for us. And so that, and then also I build around people that are better than me. Like so many people hire out of ego. Like they won't hire qualified people because their ego is like, oh, this person could be better at me than this. Or this person might overshadow me in this. And it's like every person I hire, I try to hire someone smarter than me or someone that picks up on, you know, my, my deficits because I'm really good at what I do, but I'm really bad at the things that I don't do. Right. And, and people in my office, like they joke and laugh, I'm called an idiot savant. And I understand that that's insulting. I get it, but it's true. Like I'm really good at the things that I'm really good at, but the, the, the other shit I'm terrible, like awful, not good. Shouldn't be in charge of like, I'm still the guy that has a huge desk calendar that I work off of. Right. Like I'm like, just like some of my organizational skills. So I have to have the pieces around me that will help supplement my defects. And that involve self-awareness which is something that's a hard thing for a lot of people and was really hard for me when ego was running my life and as you get older and you can start to break your shit down a little bit more and understand like oh like i'm not as you know well-rounded as i may have once thought you can either spend the time to try to get better in those areas or you can bring people into your life that are already better at those areas and they can help supplement. And that's the move that I've made and it's been huge. And so hiring the right people, building businesses with the right business partners, eliminating greed. Like you shouldn't be greedy in business. Like greed means something's unfair to me. Like greed means you're trying to get an upper hand in a situation. Like do things the right way, like be ethical in all situations, because I don't care what religious belief you have or what, how you live, like energy is absolute and energy runs through everything in this life. And if you're screwing people over in business, I can promise you that shit's coming back around to you. And if you're doing the other way, which is, you know, giving and trying to help people and being intentional with your actions and kind it will also come back around. And that's why I think my life is what it is, is because I figured that out. And that's why we do as much community work and as much, you know, charity work and nonprofit work. And it's not because it's for, you know, advertising. It's because it's the right thing to do. Like it's, it's how you should live your life. It's how you should pay shit forward. And so realizing those things and, bringing those components into every business that I have and making sure it's a part of every day and how we operate a business has been a, a huge part of our growth and our success. I really do want to reiterate how your ego is in check. I really think that so many people go down that road where it's ego. Yes, there's some greed, but I experience the ego thing and I talk about it all the time. I remember, you know, I've been in the fitness industry for 10 plus years and people would reach out to me and be like, Hey, you want to collaborate on this? You want to do this? I'm like, not really. Like I'm already here. Like I'm yep. in the fitness industry. And that closed a lot of doors for me where now I see the value in collaborations. I see the value in giving back. I see the value in teaching others. But I think that we all do go through that that egotistical phase where we think that we just know everything. And the sooner that people can realize that they don't is the, the better they can be more successful. Like you said, you have people come in, they tell you what you do wrong. And if people were more open to learning what they do wrong, rather than just constantly hearing what they do, right. Hey, you're going to be successful all day long. There's no way that if you're going to sit here and let people praise you all the time, that you're going to get any better. 
the closest people in my life now are the people that look at me and be like, you're an idiot. Like you're 1000%. Like you're like, and, and that's what I want. Like, don't hesitate. Like slap me in my face. Like tell me that I'm wrong because that's the only way a lot of us learn is when someone outside of us can come and go, Hey, wake up. This is not your way. And then you can start to look at it from outside of your situation. But yeah. And like, look at athletes, right? Like you deal with a lot of athletes. I've dealt with, I ran uh, the valet at Stingery nightclub here in San Diego when I was putting myself through law school. I was going to bring that up if that's why you got those nice cars. It, it was, it was one of the reasons. Cause that's like what I thought I wanted, but you know, I dealt with a lot of the chargers, a lot of the Padres, a lot of the players. And it's funny. Cause it's like, when these guys are on top of their game, right? Like, and they're like the guy on the team or the league, like how they treat you, like they, 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 they don't treat you well, right? Like it's ego. And it, but then when they fall off because everyone falls off because age and injuries and everything, then they'll roll through and they're the nicest people on earth because they realize that you have to be nice, right? Like that's part of life. But it's like, why can't you be nice when you're on the top? Like, why can't you treat everyone the same no matter where, what position you're at in life. Like it shouldn't matter whether the person you're dealing with is a janitor or the CEO of a fortune mm. 500 company, like just treat people the same. Like every, every person just treat like, them the Why same. is that so hard? I know it, it shouldn't be about what they can do for you or, Oh, it's, you're just a valet or like the guys that would be respectful to me then and took the time to know me then and to get to, you know, know who I was as a person are now guys that I'm friends with. Right. And they would have never thought that 13 years ago, 15 years ago, that the guy that was parking their cars on Fridays and Saturday nights at the club is someone that's going to be in a position that I'm in now, but that's life. And because they were kind and respectful to me then, now we have a relationship where we get to work together. There's business deals. There's things like that because I have respect for them. But I also remember the dudes that were just dicks. And I'm like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with you because I knew, I know how you were. Right. Like, and I, I just, that's been a, a, a big eye opener for me the last 10 years and why I try to treat everyone just the same. Like it just, everyone should be treated with kindness and respect at all times. And if you live your life that way, it's a lot easier because you don't have the drama. You don't have the bullshit. You don't have the ego and you have a lot more opportunities because people actually want to be around you. I think you're, you're a great mix of real and kind because you will also call people out on their shit and you will be honest and then you are kind. And so you know that when you're kind and you know when you're giving those compliments, they're real and they're coming from you. So that is something I want to point out that I appreciate about you as a person as well. Not everything is easy. I mean, your life looks like, yeah, I went to college, I started a law firm and now I'm successful. So what would you do or what would you say to people that have failures? Like I've started projects that I failed and I've been embarrassed about. Like, how do you overcome that? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh it's getting used to failure. Like it's getting, and, and, and I keep, we keep saying the word ego, right? Like, cause it comes back to that. Like you're the, the, the fear of failures in built into your ego, right? Cause you're worried about what other people think. And I think getting through that and realizing that like what other people think doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter. And I'll tell you what got me to that point was I have a mentor and he's a business mentor, dude's super, super great business dude, but he's just a good man. Like he just gets life and he's done like the motivational stuff. He's been on stage with Tony Robbins. Like he's that guy. And I was talking to him one day and it, this was probably about four or five years ago. And he said something to me that just, it sticks with me. And he's like, you care about what other people think really too much. And I'm like, at the time, I'm like, I didn't really I think I did. He's like, who do you think loves you the most in this world? And I'm like thinking about it. And I'm like, my mom, easy. Mom loves me to death. Like that's, I know my mom. And he's like, okay, what do you think she's thinking about right now? And I'm like, I don't know, work or something. He's like, she's not thinking about you. I'm like, no, probably not. He's like, exactly. So the person who loves you the most in this life, like that, you know, you think that your world revolves or their world revolves around you, not even thinking about you right now. Like that one person loves you more. They're not even thinking about you right now because they have their own life, their own stuff, their own, you know, and that's human beings. And once you realize that, and that I was pissed. Like when you told me that, I'm like, like, fuck you. My mom's not thinking about you. Like, you know what I mean, like, but 
it's true. Like that's how we all are. That's how we all operate. And once you realize that that's the, the human nature that you can't live for other people, like you can't live for the expectations of other people and you can't make moves based on what other people are going to think because it's your life and you're the one that's going to have to wake up in it and you're the one that's going to have to go to sleep in it. And I, I figured that out. And once I figured that out, it changed a lot for me because that was something where it shifted how I make decisions. Cause it's, is, am I making a decision that's going to make me happier? Not, am I making a decision that based on what other people are going to give me feedback on? Not even just what people think, but I see that in a lot of people's relationships where they're making decisions, life decisions that are going to change their career, just being in relationships. I mean, you know, my, you know, my history, I've been in relationships that completely weren't about me. And I look back on those days and I'm just like, man, that's the time that I needed to be selfish and make a decision for me and not what's going to be good for them because it's not their life. It's my life. And when I'm happy and when I'm successful, then I can be the best person in a relationship and I'm going to find somebody that I can give that to. But I I just hate, I have to point that out because I see so many people change their course of their life and their career for what other people think or what would benefit other people when they would never do that in return for them. A thousand percent agree. And I, you know, I think that that's, it also comes back to comfort, right? Like yes. human beings have a, an ability to stay in shitty situations because it's comfortable and more of us need to run at discomfort head on because you find yourself in discomfort and you find growth in discomfort and yeah it's 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 not always easy but it's usually what you need so many life lessons in this conversation danny so i want to talk a little bit about your bulldog rescue just because it's fairly new and i just want to learn a little bit about it i love that so i mean i've i don't know how i've accumulated as many dogs as i (laughs) i have seven dogs now which is just madness People think that I'm like I'm not living on a farm. I'm like in the middle of San Diego. Like it's just it's great. Bulldogs have run my life for a while. I started with English. I had three amazing, um, and then like a Tijuana Roof dog, and she's amazing as well. And I've always done a lot of work with rescues, mostly like uh, monetary donations, volunteer work, but really got active in running a rescue last year and was hands-on. It was kind of running it for a while myself is the people that started it had to step away and I'd never been so happy, right? Like it was like the happiest times of my life was when I was doing that. And so it was, it's always been a dream to start a sanctuary, a dog sanctuary and buy a big piece of property and be able to have a place where any dog that needs to, that can't find a home can go and have a home. And it's a, it's a farther out dream. It's like a 10 year dream from now, but I don't want to live not doing it. Right. Like I want it to be an active part of my life every day. And so I started my own rescue this year and filed for it the beginning of 2021. I'm waiting to hear back from secretary of state, but we're already rolling. I'm using, um, while I'm waiting to hear back, I'm using other rescues and basically rescuing through other rescues, which has been great. And in the last two months, we've rescued three, you know, four bulldogs. And so it's, it's great for me because one, you get to save a dog, which is awesome. And these dogs all deserve to be saved. And so many bulldogs just get kicked to the curb because of medical expenses, life, moving, whatever. And they get ditched on the streets, taken to humane society, kill shelters, et cetera. But the fun part has been watching how it changed people's lives, right? Like it is a game changer for human beings and watching how someone changes uh, once they rescue a dog is just amazing to me and seeing like the shift in just months from before and after. And so it's a, it's a ripple effect on all different sides. It's a, a benefit for the dog community because there's a dog that's saved and it's a benefit for the human community because it's good energy. People are happier. Dogs, you know, dissipate stress. Dogs take away, you know, when you have a shitty day and you come home, you're like, can't be mad when these guys are all surrounding me, you know, loving on me. So it's, it's just something that's uh, very, very close to my heart. I rescued two French Bulldogs last year. I never thought I'd be a purse dog guy. And now I'm carrying <laughs> Frenchies everywhere I go. And they run my life. Like, they're just the sweetest 
ever. And it's funny for the law firm, I'm a personal injury attorney and I deal with people that are all jacked up. And the last place they want to you know, come is a lawyer's office and the dog's take away a lot of that. Like people love being at my office. They love coming here because they get to be around the dogs and they get to play with them. And it just, it kills that level of insecurity and discomfort. And I don't want to be here. And then we can have human conversations and we can open up to each other and I can get to know people better. So it's been a great benefit for the business as well. And, you know, anyone that can add dogs to their business culture, I'm a, I'm a big proponent. I think that it's, uh, it's great for the staff. It's great for our clientele. It's great for me. It's just, it's been a, it's been a huge benefit. So anytime, like we got dogs just running around everywhere, like my office, his dog everything like we got this motorcycle back here which is like literally like a bulldog wow. so you know it's it's all things it's all things bulldog and my building is right on the five freeway looking out over downtown i got a light up bulldog that i put on the top of it it's like a bat symbol so it's it's become the brand like people now know me as like the crazy bulldog guy and i love it because it's it's who i am like it's sincere it's real it's it's not fake. It's not, you know, created. It's, it's, I'm the crazy bulldog guy. And that's why I can pull off all the crazy shit that I do in the bulldog motorcycle. And, you know, it's cause it, it is, it comes from a place of sincerity and it's not forced. And you know, that's, I try to build my life around things I love. And this is one of the things I love the most. I love that. I absolutely love that. And you know, you've really combined your passion with your job and you're lucky that you found both of them. And another thing I do want to point out is you've been very vocal in supporting small businesses and just bringing awareness to kind of what this pandemic's brought to the city. And I just want to go on record and maybe ask you if there's a future in politics for Dan Fulkerson. I've always stayed away from voicing my opinion on political shit, right? And I think it is, a lot of it's been a business decision because my demographics are anyone like you know everyone can be in an injury situation so if i make an opinionated statement on any one thing you're going to lose people right like there's going to be people that disagree with you that's just how opinions work and so i've just always kind of like stayed neutral i got really upset when gym owners in san diego started getting tagged with misdemeanors and being called criminals for trying to operate their businesses and that like pushed me over the edge and i have many friends that own gyms and they're the some of the best people that i know and for them to be called criminals in the middle of a pandemic when there's no proof that gyms have done anything to you know cause spread of coronavirus or covid I just lost it. And so I started to get very vocal and we're now representing the gyms in a lawsuit against the state of California to try to prove that California has shut down gyms without, you know, showing any sort of evidence or any sort of proof that they spread COVID. And we're also representing any and all gym owners that get charged criminally with misdemeanors for operating their gyms. And we're doing that all at no cost to any gym owners, just because I think it's the right thing to do. And I'm just, I'm now at a place where I'm okay if my opinions are going to cost me, you know, clients or going to cost me money because I think it's the right thing to do and people need to stand up for the right thing. And there's going to be disagreements and we can talk about it and have kind conversations, but I'm done biting my tongue on shit. I don't know if I'm going to go into politics. Like I, I think you can, the sad part is, is I think that right now how broken our political system is, you can almost get more done from the outside and that's not right, but I just think that it's just what I see that I can have almost more influence on the political system as a successful business owner at this point in time than I can as a politician because a politician's just thumbed and they're, you know, it's the, the two party system's broken. Like the Republican party's broken, the Democratic party's broken. Like, I don't care what you believe it's broken. And so I just, I'm disenfranchised from politics and from the system. So I don't know if I could actually run right now without feeling non-sincere about it, but 
I can definitely tell you that I'm going to be more vocal in years to come because I think that people need to be more vocal. And I think that we're going through a transition where we're watching, a, you know, a transition of this country and a transition of our right. Again, I don't believe in either party, but I believe in this country and I believe in our freedoms. And I don't think that this country was based on principles and beliefs that would have business owners being called criminals and having to go into criminal court to defend themselves in a situation like this. And so that's kind of where I'm at with everything. Yeah, that's really good to hear. I'm really glad that you're taking a stand and I really admire taking a stand on something that you believe in and being able to say that and being able to voice that because in a time like this, it is really hard to voice your opinion and voice aside even because there, yep. it is so divided that regardless of what side you're on, you're going to have backlash. So I really do, ex I really do admire that. I also do want to say that I've seen you grow. I mean, we've known each other for almost 20 years. I had to do the math yesterday and I've seen you grow I from. Barnes, not Katie Chung Ho. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, you know me on a personal level compared to anybody else. I mean, we were not just acquaintances. We were really good friends and still are. To admit that I was your manager at Abercrombie and Fitch and I oh talked out of close. I forgot you were my manager at Abercrombie. <laughs> and, and th that was a hell of a summer. We were like literally like we had the entire friend crew working <laughs> for Abercrombie that summer. And I tell people like the, the the cherry on top of all that shit is like people now know Steve Cook, right? Because everyone knows <laughs> Steve. We made Steve stand in front of that store with his shirt off is a greeter at the Abercrombie Fitch in Boise, Idaho, which is the funniest shit to me now to like think back on that. That was like, that was what we were doing. Like, we that was to, like, I need to text him and tell him because I totally forgot about that. I totally yeah, that forgot was, about that. Uh, like, you're like, what was, seems like, what do you, what do, what do you want me to do? Steve, hop <laughs> on your shirt and go stand out front and people will come in. And sure enough, like that was Steve's job. That was the start of his modeling career, man. We should have, we launched it. We should have jumped on those, <laughs> the opportunity. I want my 10%, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but I've really seen you grow into this amazing person. And I don't think, I mean, everything that's come your way is so well-deserved. You're so successful and no one else deserves it more than you. And you've worked really hard. I mean, that's not easy. On paper, it looks easy, but it definitely isn't easy. It's not an easy road. And, you know, there's times where I've been around or in college when people have visited, like you're studying, you're working, you're at your job, you're going to school. And so I'm really glad that you're in this place that you are, that you're giving back, that you're able to be happy. And I think people need to know that they need to be happy and that they don't need to chase the money. Yep. And if anyone's and you, in San Diego, you don't need as much money as you think to be happy. Like that's the, you don't need as much money as you think to be happy. Like you don't need this huge house. Like you don't need like learn from my mistakes. You don't need five freaking cars. You don't need like, you don't need that shit. Like that is not what's going to fulfill you. Yes, absolutely. But if anybody's in San Diego, they need an attorney. They can come to your office. If anyone wants to adopt a bulldog, they can go to you. And if anyone needs any motivation, really, they, they can follow you on social media. I mean, you were the first person that told me about Gary Vee. And I've really watched your social media blossom too, because you are, you are very motivating and you are very inspiring. So please share your social media handles, your website, your phone number, whatever you want to share so that people can find you. Yeah, so Dan Fulkerson, um, F-U-L-K-E-R. Don't forget the L or it becomes pretty bad pretty quickly. Um, you know, I'm easy to find. I'm the weird bulldog guy in San Diego. You drive down the five, you know, you'll see me. Big light up bulldog on the side of the building. If anyone ever has questions, you need anything, reach out anytime. Like, I got here by people helping me. So I'm always down to help anyone that, you know, needs anything. I meet with people all the time that want to go to law school and try to guide them through that and try to just, you know, whatever I can do to help. I, we started this conversation by saying like, I'm a big believer in paying shit forward. And I feel very, very fortunate to live the life that I do. And I know how lucky I am. And so I, 
try to go out of my way to, you know, help others and help pull other people up with me. And I just appreciate you having me on. Like, it's so funny to me. Like I've been looking forward to this cause it's just like, it brings, it brings like the world so full circle to me that it's like, I get to go on a podcast that you that you have. It's just like, I love it. I love it so much. Cause I like, remember, I remember our conversations at like Scott Bauer's house still Katie, cause you and I were, super close and I just so love that you're doing so well because I know like like all of us we all go through spots in life and I know you've gone through your shit and I just love that you've come out the other side and you're just as happy as you are and thriving and it just it makes me really 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 happy to see and I hope that I'll be back out in Vegas soon once COVID dies down and I expect to be seeing you when I'm back out. Yes, definitely. When you're out here, we'll do an in-person interview because I'm sure people will want to hear more from you because you have you do have a lot of successful tips and we can be more hands-on and and be able to communicate a little bit more because I know Zoom is a little hard with with audio and everything. But thank you for the compliments. I appreciate it. I can't wait. I always think about our mutual friends like listening to our podcasts and calling us out on our bullshit. So I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Jonah with all of them, like with like Matt and Scotty and Jonathan and Brandon in like April. So yeah. I love that you guys do an all boys trip and that you stay close. I really, I'm really jealous about it. So make sure you tell everyone that I said hi. I will. I will for sure. Well, thank you for meeting with me and hopefully I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks.